Hi everyone. Welcome to today's TVC webinar, Structure and Function of Tropical Ecosystems. This webinar is part of the 2028 TVC webinar series. Previous webinars have been devoted to understanding COVID-19 and the wildlife trade, developing professional skills in tropical biology and conservation, and teaching tropical biology. We are really pleased to have you here with us to launch our fourth topic, Frontiers in Tropical Biology. My name is Alvaro Duque. I am an associate professor at the Department of Forest Science at the National University of Columbia. My research focus is understanding the main driver of changes in both forest diversity and its carbon stocks along environmental, spatial, and temporal gradients in Amazon and Andean ecosystems. My co-host in this webinar is Jennifer for Powers. Go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, my name is Jennifer Powers. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota in the United States. Um, my research program broadly is focused on understanding the structure and function of seasonally dry tropical forest ecosystems. I also serve as the editor-in-chief uh, for the Journal of the ATBC, Biotropica. Um, and so again, as Alvaro mentioned, this is our first webinar devoted to, uh, to our series Frontiers in Tropical Biology. And the subject of this webinar is uh, Structure fu and Function of Tropical Ecosystems. Um, we've planned a series of talks today that explore questions about the structure and functions of tropical ecosystems in a rapidly changing world by focusing in depth on three different biomes, on rainforests, on seasonally dry forests, and on savannas. Our panelists will address questions such as, what are the patterns of forest productivity and how does this inform our knowledge of the global carbon cycle? What are the roles of soils, climatic variation, um, and fire disturbance in determining the structure and function of tropical ecosystems? And how can we leverage our new understanding of these processes to improve simulation models, conservation, or management? Okay, before I introduce you to our first speaker, I would like to run you through some general logistics and are those you can see here in the slides. Uh, we're all microf um, the microphones and um, videos are not activated for the webinar attendees. The talks will be recorded, so you are going to be available to watch everything again. I think this will all, we only, we only be able to see the speakers and moderators. Please submit any questions through the Q&A tabs. Questions will be read and addressed after the three tabs during the Q&A session. The chat function is only activated to panelists. If you have any problem, any technical issue, whatever, please look at this email and just address it to it, please. So, our first speaker here is uh, Jadbinder Mali. Jadbinder Mali is Professor of Ecosystem Science at the University of Oxford and Director of the Oxford Center for Tropical Forests. He research focuses on the function of tropical forests and savanna ecosystems, how they vary across regions, and how they change under the pressures of local and global change. In particular, he founded the Global Ecosystem Monitoring GEM Networks, which measures the carbon and biochemical cycles of tropical forests at sites spanning the tropics, and relates this to biogeography, climate, soils, and trends. More broadly, he's interested in everything about the biosphere and the tropical biosphere in particular. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and past president of the ATBC. So Jadinder, we are delighted to have you here. And there is a very big audience waiting for you. So go ahead and welcome. Thank you, Alvaro, and thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to, to, to be here with you. And greetings from Oxford, where it's a, a cold and dark evening tonight. But I greet you across the tropics. And it's nice to see you all virtually, if you haven't been able to see each other phys physically at this time. So let me just share my screen. When you look. And, and let me just get this uh, screen going. Okay, so uh, welcome to my uh, uh, 
uh, to my presentation. So I'm going to explore the relationship between productivity and uh, growth and structure across the, the tropical forest biome. Firstly, so I should check, can you see my screen okay? Is everything fine? So I presume that that is okay. Uh, and when, when we think of questions around uh, uh, tropical forests, we tend to uh, think about uh, the uh, forest inventory as a way of understanding the structure sorry. of, of yeah, the Yeah, Vinder, we are yep. not seeing your slides, I'm sorry. Okay, let me try again. Let's, uh, let's try again. Is that good? Can you see me? That's better, okay. yes. Thank you. Right. Thanks Sorry a lot. About that. Okay. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to explore the relationship between productivity and growth and structure across the humid tropical forest biome. And uh, uh, when we think about forest structure and how we want to understand forest structure, we think often as the, as the forest inventory as a tool that we want to to assess and understand all that. And, and the forest inventory really is the workhorse of tropical forest dynamics and understanding uh, dynamics and biomass. If we go out, we measure diameter of trees, maybe we measure their height and we get their biomass. And lots of really powerful insights have emerged from forest inventories, evidence of the tropical forest carbon sink, evidence of the sink weakening over time, and lots of interesting spatial patterns related to, 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 to the function uh, uh, of forests and the tropical forest biome. But uh, uh, my focus here is to remember that the, the, uh, the woody biomass that we think of when we do a forest inventory sits inside a much larger carbon cycle and biogeochemical cycle within the forest. So within this forest, there's lots of energy and nutrients and carbon flowing through the leaves, flowing through, through the soil. And uh, the woody biomass may be the long-lived component of the carbon cycle, but actually it's only one of many components of that cycle. So to understand structure and dynamics and productivity, we need to understand how the woody biomass sits inside the wider context of the, uh, the carbon or nutrient cycling of, of forests. And so to look at this another way, uh, often when, when we're trying to understand forests at a global scale or at a local scale, we tend to work at two different scales. One is at the level of the standing biomass, the inventory and trying to understand the structure and biomass of a forest. Or the other one is if, if we have a more ecophysiological focus, we might focus on trying to model photosynthesis or measure photosynthesis or use satellites to, to, to map photosynthesis. And implicit uh, in a lot of literature is that these two are somehow connected that if we understand photosynthesis, we can say something about the biomass in the forest. If we're seeing changes in biomass, we can say something about how photosynthesis is changing over time. And we have different tools to look at these two angles. We may be using global vegetation models or flux towers or remote sensing to, to, to work at that global, at that photosynthesis level. Uh, or we may be using forest inventories or forest dynamics models or biomass remote sensing to work at the level of biomass. So the two ends of, of this chain of, of carbon cycling in, in a forest that we look at, and we use different tools to look at those, and we try and understand how they link to each other. Now we have a slightly more refined approach. We may recognize that woody growth is an intermediary process that links photosynthesis to structure. So photosynthesis must in some way relate to the rate of growth of trees that ends up relating to biomass and structure. And uh, often, if we assume that there's some sort of quasi-linear relationship between productivity and, uh, and woody growth, uh, if we assume it's very lin linear, we may have this photosynthesis growth paradigm, that somehow photosynthesis is linked to woody growth. And if we see patterns of woody growth, they tell us about patterns of photosynthesis. If we think that woody growth rates are linked to biomass, we are part of this growth biomass paradigm. And certainly in the secondary forest, we would expect uh, woody growth to somehow related to the biomass that's there. Uh, uh, but in old growth forests, that pattern may, may be different. Uh, if we have a more refined analysis, we may come up with all the intermediary parts of this chain. So we know that uh, gross primary productivity links to net primary productivity, which is a total rate of biomass creation in a, in a forest, whether it's in leaves or roots 
or, or, or in woody material. And a fraction of that NPP, that net primary productivity, goes to woody production. And, uh, uh, and the relationship between woody production and standing biomass uh, is determined partially by, by the rate of production, but all, as much or even more so by the rate of mortality, how long the trees live for, how long they stick around for. And uh, so to understand biomass, we also need to understand the rate of tree death or what could be called the residence time, how long trees stick around. So what we want to do ideally is have this more complete understanding of some forests to understand what we can infer about the relationship between one aspect of forest function, which is photosynthesis, and another aspect of forest fe features, which is biomass or forest structure. And so, so just to revisit some of these terms again that I'll be using, the total photosynthesis in a forest uh, uh, can lead, uh, a large part of that photosynthesis is respired in the metabolism of the plants and the ecosystem itself. This is the autotrophic respiration. The rest of it goes on to make biomass, and that can be, uh, or NPP, net primary production, that can be in the canopy, that can be in the wood, or that can be in the coarse or fine roots. All that material ends up dying either through litter fall or, or senescence or eventually through mortality and ends up as dead material, which ends up being uh, re released back to the atmosphere as heterotrophic respiration through the activities of primarily of fungi and bacteria. And uh, in the network that uh, I've been coordinating over the last decade or so called the GEM uh, network, the Global Ecosystems Monitoring Network, we've tried to measure these various components and track uh, and understand how, how they fit together. And I haven't got time in this talk to, to go through how we do them in detail, but broadly we look at growth rates uh, through dendrometer bands, we use ingrowth cores and rhizotrons to look at root productivity, we use get CO2 chambers to measure the respiration from stems or from roots or from different components of the soil. And uh, we also do similar short-term measurement on the canopy to look at photosynthesis and respiration and couple this with leaf traits and with, with, with climate. And what we end up with is our diagrams like this. This is one example for a site in Peru at Tambopata showing you the photosynthesis at the top and how that breaks down into the different components of NPP and respiration and productivity. And what we've managed to do over the last decade is produce diagrams like this for around now around 40 or 50 different sites across the tropics, so mainly in tropical forests, but also some in tropical savannas. And one feature I'll just point out here in the, in the, in the details is that if you look at the woody growth rate, the focus of the forest inventory, it's about 7% of the total photosynthesis of all the carbon being absorbed by the leaves, only around 7% ends up producing woody biomass. That's important, of course, because that's long lived and that determines the long term carbon store about in, in the biomass. But in terms of understanding the carbon cycle, we can see that small changes in what's going on in the canopy or in stems and other components can end up having a strong influence uh, on, on that woody biomass. So the link between photosynthesis and biomass is mediated by all these other components. And this, sh this shows you a, a, a snapshot of the sites across the tropics where either we've directly been applying the GEM protocol, which are sites that are triangles, or where collaborators, our partners, have, have been doing similar measurements and have included them in this broader network. And those, those are the circles. And you see on many sites in blue, we have these carbon cycling measurements, others in brown, we also couple them with with trait data, so, so we can link the carbon cycle to the traits. And we span everywhere from, uh, from the heart of Africa to, to, to the South Pacific and various places in between in, in, in getting, uh, getting this network and the data from this network. And so what I'm gonna focus on in this talk is just give you three contrasting environmental gradients and look at some of the classic questions we have in tropical forest eco ecology and see what this, uh, whole forest perspective, whole carbon cycle perspective, what insights that can give us into either answering those questions or giving us new ways of thinking about those questions. So the first contrast I'm going to look at is between wet, humid tropical forests and drier uh, trop tropical forests. And uh, you know, one uh, uh, 
one possible question that we can ask is, you know, how do these dry forests com compare? Why do they have lower biomass than wet forests? And one possible hypothesis we could come up with is that seasonal water stress limits photosynthesis in the dry season, which restricts annual growth, which results in lower biomass. And that's quite plausible. It seems very mechanistic and ecophysiologically plausible. And uh, so in the in this study, uh, what we can do is break this down and look at the components uh, of, a, 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 of the carbon cycle to try and understand this. And this is a, a, a look at this the slide carefully because this is, a, this is a type of analysis I'm going to be using throughout my talk. And what I've done here is understand tree growth as the product of photosynthesis times the fraction of photosynthesis that goes into biomass production times a fraction of biomass that goes into woody growth production. This is purely a mathematical identity. If these GPPs cancel out, these NPPs cancel out, but it breaks down the, uh, the components of, uh, uh, that go from photosynthesis uh, through to, to, to woody growth rate. So tree growth is photosynthesis times what we call the carbon use efficiency, this, this ratio of NPP to GPP, times a fraction of NPP that goes, goes to the wood. And if you want to think about biomass for a near equilibrium system, we can go a bit further. We can say that biomass is woody growth rate times the residence time, how long uh, bi woody biomass stay stays around in the system. And oh, we can break that down and show that in the four components, these four components multiply together to give woody biomass. So the transect I'm going to describe is in Amazonia. And uh, we have two transects, one, uh, one in the Western Amazon, which tends to have more fertile soils and higher productivity, going from the wet north, northeast of Peru in Alpawayo near Iquitos, down to Tambo Plata near Puerto Maldonado, and down into Bolivia uh, to the cycle Kenya, which is right on the, on, on, on the edge of the Amazon forest biome. And also we have one in Eastern Amazonia going from humid forest at Cachuana down to dry forest at Tanguro, which is Generally, these are more infertile soils that we find uh, less fertility on these older, more weathered soils of the Eastern Amazon. Uh, but so it's a parallel transect or, or two points uh, in, in the East. And if we look broadly at the patterns of, of data, we see that the photosynthesis, the gross primary productivity from our plots does decrease with increasing water stress. So the axis here is, as you go to the right, the stronger seasonal drought, stronger, stronger water, dress, so water stress. So we see photosynthesis does See, on an annual scale, does seem to decline with increasing water stress. Uh, the carbon use efficiency says there's a strong pattern. Uh, uh, maybe it increases slightly in the drier sites compared to the wetter sites. So a bigger fraction of photosynthesis ends up in biomass production. Uh, and uh, the, in terms of allocation, we see, uh, in terms of NPP, we see a weaker decline uh, than we see in, over, in photosynthesis because of this effect of, of carbon use efficiency. But if we look at residence time, how long trees stay in the system, and we have a wider data set here, not just the, the intensive sites, we see that broadly there's an increase in residence time to in moderately seasonal forests. And then as you get into drier systems, the residence time decreases sharply. So tree mortality rates are much higher in the very dry system, and they're lowest in the moderately dry system uh, overall. And uh, so, so, so now we can use this identity to explore this relationship in a bit more detail. So what I've done here is compare the driest site in a transect, in this case, one in Bolivia, in turn, with the, the slightly more humid sites, uh, in this case, in, in Peru. And what I've done here is plot the ratio of the value in the dry site compared to, to, to the more humid sites. So for example, in this case, we show that the woody growth rate is slightly higher in the drier side, only 5% higher than, uh, than in, the, uh, in, in the wet side, so always, always not significant. The photosynthesis is substantially lower in the dry side, and this is consistent with the chart I just showed. There seems to be, on an annual scale, less productivity in the dry side. However, the carbon use efficiency, the fraction of that photosynthesis that's used to make biomass, whether it's leaves or wood or roots, is higher in the drier side. And also the fraction of that woody biomass that is actually going into or biomass creation that's going into woody biomass is also higher. So what we see overall is that, yes, there is less photosynthesis in the dry side, probably because of seasonal water stress and stomata or leaves being shed in the, in, in the dry period, but that 
decline is offset by these other factors that uh, of higher carbon use efficiency and higher allocation to wood. So overall, there's a slight increase, or you could say non-significant change in woody growth rates, despite there being less photosynthesis in the dry forest. If we, we can also replicate that in the Eastern Amazon transect, and we see almost exactly the same pattern in the Eastern Amazon as in the Western Amazon. Uh, so overall, well, the, the, this result has some replication. And uh, if we go further and look at biomass, what we see is that, yes, the biomass is substantially lower in the dry forest, it's about 40% lower, but it's not caused by the woody growth rate, because I just explained that the woody growth rate ends up being not very different. It's caused by the fact that the residence time is about half uh, uh, in the dry forest compared to the wet forest. So the dry forest has low biomass, not because it has low photosynthesis rates, which it does, but because it has high death rates, it's the mortality that drives the pattern of biomass that we see and the lower biomass that we see in the dry, in the dry forest system. So that gives you, uh, and we can replicate that with the Eastern tra Amazon transect, and you see exactly the same pattern there. So we see some consistency here. So what this tells us is that in this case, when we look at this photosynthesis growth paradigm, uh, it breaks down because of uh, uh, the, the compensating relationships in carbon use efficiency in the allocation that offset the decline in photosynthesis that we see. And also the growth par biomass paradigm breaks down because mortality ends up being a more important predictor of, of biomass than, than changes in, in, in productivity. So this gives you an example of how when we take this whole holistic approach, we see that some of our assumptions break down uh, in predicting the patterns we see. So for example number two, I'm going to take a, a, a different transect, which is going from the lowland Amazon rainforest up into the humid tropical montane forests. Uh, uh, this is a site at 3,000 meters. And you, and you see that these are very different. They, it's much colder, around 12 degrees mean annual temperature, lots of tree ferns, lots of epiphytes. And, uh, and we, for a long time, it's been known that these montane forests tend to have slower growth rates. They tend to have... Uh, lower biomass uh, overall. And it's been speculated that this is because of the lower temperatures affecting photosynthesis or affecting uh, nutrient cycling. And uh, the data I'm going to show are from our transect that we have in Peru, going from the upper montane forest, uh, where I'm standing here, looking down the valley into the lowland Amazon in, in the far distance. And you see this is a nice temperature contrast from about 8 degrees near the top to 26 degrees in the lowlands. And, over the last 10, 15 years, we've been doing a range of studies using this as a temperature laboratory to try and understand how temperature controls ecosystem function. So we can have a range of hypotheses about what happens in the montane system, that low temperatures slow down photosynthesis, or they slow down nutrient cycling, or something about the water logging and the wet condition, or it could be an allo allocation issue with more, more carbon going to roots and less going to, to woody production, or it could be something to do with the clouds and light supply and uh, 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 immersion in water that affects it. If we look at the broad pattern at this transect, what we see overall is a decline of photosynthesis with elevation. Uh, so there is less photosynthesis in the mountains than there is in, in the lowlands. Uh, but when we look with a, the richer data set of NPP, we're not so sure if it's a linear decline or whether there seems to be no variation up to cloud base, which is the dashed line, and then above cloud base there's no variation. So this would suggest, if this is true, this suggests that temperature doesn't have a major effect, but it's the cloudiness of cloud immersion in the cloud forest that has an effect. Another thing we see is that carbon use efficiency shows no variation with temperature or with elevation. So the fraction of photosynthesis that's going into metabolism does not seem to vary as you go up the mountain. So we can use a similar approach. So that what we applied in the previous example, we can compare the cloud forests to the lowland forests. And in this case, we see that there is less woody growth in the cloud forests, and that is caused by less photosynthesis. By, uh, in this particular case of the plots, a slight decrease in carbon use efficiency. And overall, we see very little trend and no significant change in allocation. So it really is the lower photosynthesis that dominates in driving the lower, lower wood, woody growth rates that, that we see. So the, so the cloud forest is simply a scaled down version of the carbon cycle of the lowland forest, which is very different from what we saw going along the wet to dry transect. 
And if you look at biomass, we see in this case that the biomass does, is driven, the decline in biomass that we see is strongly influenced by the decline in growth rate. And actually the mortality rate slightly works in the opposite direction. Trees do live for slightly longer in the cloud forest, in this case, than in the lowland forest. And slightly, so that slightly offsets the, the lower woody growth rates. So overall, the low biomass in a cloud forest is shaped by the fact that photosynthesis slows down and that slows down the rate of woody growth. Uh, and, and that's a predominant factor that drives uh, the lower biomass. So we see that the chain of causality is very different in this elevation transect than it is from the wet to dry transect. But we can unpick that by using this, this uh, uh, carbon cycle approach. And so uh, what, uh, what, drives, what slows down the photosynthesis? Uh, there's a whole other range of work that, we, that I haven't gone into here that argues that it isn't actually lower photosynthetic capacity. The, the photosynthesis uh, per unit time is the same in the mountains as in the lowlands. It seems to be uh, 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 more linked to light supply and environment ra uh, uh, inhibiting photosynthesis rather than temperature itself. We seem to see, be finding strong evidence that low temperatures themselves aren't controlling uh, the decline in photosynthesis that we see with elevation. So the, the final example I'm going to go give is, is going pan, uh, pan tropical and I want to compare the forests of Borneo on the left but with the forests of lowland Amazonia on the right. Now both, both forests have magnificent lowland forests, both, both regions have magnificent lowland forests, but Borneo in particular is famous for having the tallest tropical forests in the world with a mean canopy height in a Bornean forest is around 50 meters uh, quite, quite often, whereas an Amazonian forest would be more like 25 or 30 meters in terms of mean canopy height. So something causes the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the height of forest to be higher in Borneo. Uh, and this uh, scan, so these are laser scans from trees in, in Borneo. And the one on the right is the tallest uh, known uh, uh, tree in the tropics that we described a few years ago called Manara. And it's uh, around 100 meters in, in height. And uh, we just had a paper out earlier this week that uh, just argued that uh, the lower wind speeds in Borneo uh, particularly the extreme winds may be the reason why trees are able to grow taller in Borneo than, 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 than in Amazonia. But the uh, question I want to ask here is, uh, with this very slender architecture in Borneo, uh, what, is, what, what is the carbon cycle here? How, do, how is enough carbon supplied to, to produce the, these tall, uh, thin forests that we have in Borneo compared to Amazonian forests? So possible hypotheses could be that soils or climate conditions lead to higher productivity in Borneo, that uh, soils are somehow better than in Amazonia, there's more photosynthesis and therefore higher productivity, or it could be a biogeographical factor that the diptocarps that dominate in Borneo have different carbon use efficiency or different carbon allocation to Amazonian forests, or it could be something to do with residence time and mortality, that trees live longer in Borneo, leading to, to these high biomass forests. And so when we compare, what I've done is compare six humid Amazonian forests with six humid Borneo forests where we have these gem data. And what we see in terms of woody growth rate is quite a striking pattern. What we see is that overall the uh, growth rates, biomass production rates in Borneo are around 50% higher than they are in uh, Amazonia. But it's not because photosynthesis is higher. Photosynthesis is, is the same in both forests are very, very similar. Nor is it because carbon use efficiency is different, NPP is the same in both. It's because of allocation. A larger fraction of woody biomass production is going into wood. It, uh, biomass production is going into wood in Borneo than it is in Amazonia. And it's a very clear pattern that we see consistently uh, across uh, our, our plots. So, uh, and if we look at biomass, in Borneo, it is higher to around 60 to 70% higher in Bornean forests than in Amazonian forests. And it's largely driven by the fact that woody production rates are higher and the turnover rates and residence times are very similar in those systems. So it's out of the shifting allocation that seems to be providing the extra woody biomass carbon that ends up determining these very high biomass in Bornean forests. Uh, so what, what is this allocation story? Well, the interesting uh, story seems to be to do with how much carbon is going to wood versus how much is going into other components. So this ternary diagram shows 
the, uh, the, the partition of woody bio, of biomass production between fine roots, between canopy, and between wood. And I haven't got time to go into detail, but here we have sites in the Americas, which have fairly equal partitioning, and, and in black we have sites in Borneo. And we see overall there's much less allocation to roots in Borneo and much more allocation to wood. So, the, so it's, the, it's the lack of uh, investment in roots that enables this greater investment in wood. And this may be linked to the fact that diptocarps are ectomycorrhizal trees and have a very different carbon allocation strategy than the arbuscular mycorrhizal forests that dominate. So mycorrhizal uh, strategies may be shaping the biomass and productivity and biogeographical biogeogra patterns in those. So to conclude on this one, uh, it seems to be that biogeography and allocation strategies shape the difference in biomass and, and growth rates between Borneo and Amazonia. So uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm at 25 minutes, so I'll, so I'll, I'll just come to conclusions. Uh, so what I've described is, is how differences in productivity and allocation end up shaping the patterns that we see in forest structure. What I haven't answered here answered here is why productivity varies over space in the tropics. Well, partially I have answered it because we show clearly that length of dry season is an important pat, uh, factor in driving productivity. But once you're in the, the wet systems, it seems to be a much more confusing pattern that we don't see a strong relationship between soils and nutrients and productivity. And we're still trying to, to puzzle apart the direct effects of the environment on productivity and the indirect effects in which environment affects functional traits and stand structure and that affects uh, uh, pro pro productivity and that's been a major focus of our work over the over the uh, the last few years uh, and we've been using plant traits collector these data to, 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 to explore these in, in detail so just to conclude a whole carbon budget perspective provides valuable new perspe perspectives on some of the classic questions in tropical forest ecology like uh, what uh, why as a low biomass and dry forests, why are montane forests low in productivity? Why are Bornean forests so massive compared to Amazonian forests? Or at least it helps us reframe the questions that we're asking, if not provide clear answers. And such a perspective is necessary to interpret and model current responses of tropical forest function to global atmospheric change. And we encourage researchers and students to work with the sites or to work with the data in the GEM network and also to contribute these types of measurements to, from their own work uh, to, to, to this global network. So thank you. And uh, this work, I should say, this work involves a, a whole range of co-authors, students and researchers here in Oxford and partners and collaborators all around uh, the tropics. So it wouldn't be possible without the huge amount of work and time that all these partners around the tropics have put into actually going out every month and collecting uh, these data. So thank you. Yadvinder, thank you so much. So thank you so much. That was just a wonderful talk. And I think it really helped set this, uh, this scene or the stage for, um, uh, for some of these, these big questions. Um, so thank you, that was just wonderful. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Kyle Dexter. Um, oh, and I just want to remind folks, if you do have questions for Yadvinder, for Kyle, for Natasha, could you please submit them through the Q&A function? Um, and then we'll address all of the questions at the end of the, the talks. Um, so again, it's my great pleasure to introduce Kyle Dexter. Um, he received his PhD from Duke University, go Blue Devils, um, and he, where he was advised by John Turborg and Cliff Cunningham. And his work um, for his PhD focused on understanding the community assembly of trees in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, then he did a postdoc fellowship working with Jerome Shaw on community assembly in French Guiana. Um, and he became interested in dry tropical biomes there. Um, and he set out some themes that we've seen uh, that we see carried through his work of really understanding how um, dry tropical forests are responding to changing climate. Uh, this work led to a, a postdoc fellowship with Tony Pennington in the Royal Botanic Garden of Edinburgh and Oliver Phillips at Leeds, um, studying niche evolution and biome switching in South American trees. And Kyle started a position as a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh in 2013. Um, he's continued this cross-biome work 
um, in South America and has started working in South in uh, in Africa in savannas, uh, shrublands, and dry desert environments or dry biomes. His current research group comprises folks working on evolutionary ecology, ecosystem function, and biogeography of tropical trees in both wet and dry biomes, um, both in South Africa, sorry, in, um, in South America and in Africa. So Kyle, I'm just delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. And I'll invite you to share your screen. Thank you, take it away, Kyle. Great, thanks a lot, Jennifer. Um, Thanks a lot to ATBC and ATBC and Lucia and Jennifer and Alvaro for inviting me to give this presentation. It was really an honor to be on this stage uh, with Yadvinder and Natoshi. So indeed, uh, my job here is to talk about tropical dry forests. So I'm gonna start off with this slide, which I think is a, a common perception of uh, the major biomes in the tropics. And it's not to pick on Marina Herota too much. This is a very nice article, it's very useful. But it's, uh, it shows the, a common simplification of the tropics into forest, savanna, and treeless, with treeless being uh, uh, deserts and, and grasslands. So this talk is mostly going to focus on wooded ecosystems. So uh, in this context, it would be forest and savanna. And I would argue that this uh, simplification of just forest and just savanna uh, is perhaps too simple and we just need to get a, a, a slightly more complicated because it, in these contexts when people talk about forests they're almost always talking about rainforests and I want to try and insert dry forests uh, a bit more into the discussion. So, so to do that uh, I'm first going to go through what uh, me and collaborators have been calling dry forest and what it is exactly and that's going to be based on a lot of studies we've been doing in the neotropics and then I'm going to talk about patterns of floristic composition across neotropical dry forests because ultimately I am more of a biogeographer, uh, sort of a species centric ecologist. And then I'm going to talk a bit about where there might be tropical dry forests in Africa and Asia. Now that I'm starting to work in Africa a bit, this is really uh, occupying my thoughts quite a lot. And then I'll, I'll come to some conclusions. So tropical dry forests are forests with highly seasonal water availability. I guess that's obvious from the name tropical dry forests. And this can, uh, in the neotropics at least, dry forests are generally largely deciduous, not 100%, but uh, usually over 70, 80% deciduous. They lose most of their leaves in the dry season, which I would argue leads to quite different patterns of uh, nutrient cycling and ecosystem function in these systems. Dry forests don't always have a closed canopy. So, uh, so rainforest, uh, uh, unless it's in early successional stages, may, will have a closed canopy. Dry forest can be more open. Uh, and this is a picture from some inter-Andean uh, valley dry forest in Bolivia. And then the, the key distinction between tropical dry forests and savannas is fire. So they're both seasonally dry systems, but dry forests are full of taxa that can't really survive regular fire. So this is a, another dry forest stand in, uh, in Bolivia, and it's full of these uh, arborescent cacti. And I don't know if you've ever put a cactus in a fire, but it doesn't live very long. So if you like the cactus, I don't recommend doing it. But uh, whereas savannas have this grassy understory that burns regularly. And so while some dry forests can burn, and they do burn sometimes, even the Amazon burns sometimes when it gets dry enough, it's not a regular feature of the system. And that's indicated by all these taxa present in dry forests that, that can't really tolerate fire. So that's, that's our, our conception of what dry forests are and what sets them apart from rainforest and sets them apart from savannas. And I'm gonna talk a, a bit about where they're found. So to show a slide from our previous speaker, Yadvinder, uh, this is a paper of his from 2009, looking at the possibility of uh, climate-induced dieback of the Amazon and it shows a, a frequent conception of how tropical biomes are organized in the major environmental gradient that the tropics uh, experiences, which is water availability. So this is just a schematic showing rainfall versus climatological water deficit, which is a measure of how much uh, drought stress or water stress plants feel during the dry season. And so in areas with no water limitation and lots of rain, you have rainforest, and areas that are much drier and have a high seasonality to, to water availability of savanna, 
And then between the two would be seasonal forests. In a paper in 2018, we looked at the distribution of moist forests, semi-deciduous, dry forests, which are here mostly deciduous forests. Uh, the moist forest category is mostly evergreen. And savannas in lowland tropical South America, east of the Andes, so mostly Brazil and some of Peru and Bolivia. And, and what we saw was quite surprising, even though it's a, a fairly simple figure, is that what we're calling dry forests in the neotropics, these deciduous forests, are actually quite often in much drier areas than savanna. And so once you consult the literature and, uh, and think this through a bit, it's not terribly surprising. So, so what's going on here is that in these really dry areas, you don't actually have enough rainfall to build up sufficient grass biomass on an annual basis to have regular fire. So it's basically so arid, the, the, the grasses can't, can't uh, be enough of an ecological force to, to, to bring fire to the system. And so trees, again, dominate in these really dry areas, just as they do in really wet areas where they can outcompete grass and form a toast canopy. And interestingly, semi-deciduous forests seem to have the exact same uh, climatic niche with respect to precipitation, at least, as savannas. So that's interesting in the context of thinking of alternate stable states. So in climatic space, dry forests uh, might fall in a place that is surprising to, to some. And then in, uh, in edaphic space, is thinking about the other main axis of environmental variation in the tropics, thinking about edaphic variation. This, uh, these results came from a paper led by Marcelo Bueno, who did a sandwich with uh, me and Toby Pennington in Edinburgh, and then uh, is now a professor in uh, Universidade de Mato Grosso do Sul uh, in Brazil. And so in this study, he, uh, he looked at a bunch of sites across the Cejado domain of Brazil. So the Cejado domain has Cejado vegetation, which is savanna vegetation, as well as different kinds of forests, like dry forests and uh, deciduous forests, evergreen forests, and semi-deciduous forests. And he looked at, this is uh, each one of these points on this map is a, a site where the tree species have been inventoried. And the, the figure is an ordination based on tree species composition, and then laying some environmental vectors on there. And what we see is that the main thing distinguishing dry forests from savannas is soil fertility, and also distinguishing it from wet forests for that matter. And then the main thing distinguishing the evergreen and semi-deciduous forests is water availability. So, so this points to this uh, issue of how dry forests are quite different. If we're gonna start thinking about savanna forest transitions in, in say the Sahara domain of Brazil, uh, different environmental changes will lead to dry forest versus uh, moist forest. So we probably shouldn't be equating all forests as the same when we're thinking about these transitions. So, so dry forests are found in drier areas in savanna quite often, and certainly drier areas than moist forest. And also when they occur in areas where savanna can also occur, they're usually on more fertile soils. Just if you're curious, the, the moist forests here would usually be on uh, in gallery forests along river edges or mata ciliar around lakes and uh, other water bodies. So that's a bit about where dry forests are found in climatic and environmental space. And this slide shows our understanding of their distribution. So in the neotropics, I would argue that we have a, a pretty good idea of where dry forests are found. This is a, a paper by Reynaldo Leonardo Paromino, a Peruvian who works for the Smithsonian but lives in Peru, who's a leading expert on Peruvian dry forests. And he put together this review paper showing the distribution of dry forests across the neotropics. And you can see the largest extent is in northeastern Brazil in the Caitinga or the Caitinga, uh, depending on where you're from. There's also large extents in Mexico uh, and the north coast of South America, and then scattered through the Andes and across the Caribbean. So that brings me to the end of my first bullet point of what tropical dry forests are and where they're found in the neotropics. And then I'll just move on to patterns of floristic composition. So in 2016, the Dry Floor Floristic Network published this paper. So that's a network that was led by Toby Pennington. We kind of passed the baton a bit to Karina Banda. So Karina Banda was a PhD student with Toby and I, and she led this paper, which was the first paper to pull together tree species composition information from dry forests right across the neotropics. So it involves people from Argentina all the way up to Mexico. And we had all these people 
uh, dig into the literature in their home countries and access their collaborative networks. And each one of the points on this map represents a place where somebody has gone and inventoried the tree species in, in, in that place. And so it's not proper plot data necessarily. It could come from transects or floristic inventories or many different kinds of data. But, uh, but again, it's the, the breadth of the data. And also these are mostly taxonomists or taxonomically minded ecologists uh, doing these uh, data assemblies. So, so the taxonomy is uh, about as good as you can get for a large scale data set. And we just did something quite simple was look at how widespread tree species were in these dry forests or how restricted their distributions were. And if you do simple clustering analyses of these sites based on species composition, you see the, 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 the overriding signal in the data is geographic turnover. So the main groups in the, the data in terms of species composition are geographically restricted. There are no tree species found across all groups. And in fact, there's only a handful of tree species, less than 10, that are found across five or more of these groups. And the large majority of tree species are restricted to a single group. So there's really big floristic turnover within these dry forests, which may be related to their Apache distributions. We're not sure about that, but it, it, it certainly could play a role. Um, and wait, that's the main point I wanted to make. With that. Moving on. So, so how does the, the composition of dry forests compare to the composition of other biomes in the lowland tropics? So these are some results from a paper led by one of my PhD students, Pedro Solagui Miranda. And he took similar data, species inventory data, uh, again from across lowland tropical South America in this particular study. And I should say quickly where these data come from because our credit uh, is due to Ari Oliveira Filio. So this is a long-term collaborator of mine from Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais in, uh, in Brazil. And this is his life's work of putting together this database of tree species inventories from across the neotropics, uh, really like strongly in Brazil, but now expanded elsewhere where he's done, paid really good attention to that taxonomy and trying to use the latest taxonomic opinion on the identity of every tree species. And, uh, and uh, anyway, it's just a really fantastic database. And so Pedro, working with that database, did similar analyses to, to what Karina did in her science paper, but focused on different vegetation types. And what he found that, that despite the high floristic turnover within dry forests, they are a floristically uh, coherent group. So all the moist forests either fell into an Amazon group or an Atlantic forest group. Savannas all fell in one group and dry forests fell on, all fell in one group. So that was for Eastern lowland tropical South America, which is still a pretty big region. But in a recent paper led by Ricardo Segovia, who was a postdoc working with me in Edinburgh and has uh, since gone back to his native Chile to work, uh, we took data from across the Americas. So we fused this neotrop tree database that Ari has put together and combined it with the forest inventory analysis data from the, the National Forest uh, Service in the United States and combined this. And we looked at patterns of composition in this whole data set. So again, each one of these points is a, a tree species inventory. So these are not herbarium data and I could talk ad nauseum about why we think these kinds of data are better for these kinds of analyses than say herbarium data, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and then to, to do these analyses of how similar sites were in terms of species composition or not, we used evolutionary approaches. And I, I, again, I'm not gonna go into details, but just quickly why we do that is because when you're working at this geographic and environmental scale, many sites do not share any tree species at all. So you, would have, uh, you wouldn't have much information in the data, actually. Whereas when you use phylogenies, you can always ask about what proportion of, or how much evolutionary history is shared by the tree floors at two sites. And these analyses focus on angiosperms. All of these sites have angiosperms. So they all share some evolutionary history, but the amount varies. So there's a lot more uh, information in the data to, to help you determine what sites are similar or not in terms of composition. Anyways. The, the main thing that came out of this, or the main things, uh, was there was a clear segregation between tropical and extratropical floras, which I'm not gonna dwell on here because we're talking about the tropics. Within the tropics, there was a division between wet and dry, and which isn't a terrible, terrible surprise, I, uh, I suppose, but the most uh, interesting thing was that all the dry forests fell into one group, 
whereas the semi-deciduous forests in most of the savannas fell with the tropical moist forest group. So that suggests that the dry forests really do have a, a unique compositional identity right across the neotropics, and that that, uh, that identity is evolutionarily old. So, so there's a lot of lineages, not just species, but lineages of trees that are restricted to these tropical dry forests. And yet, uh, for example, savannas do not have that unique evolutionary identity, perhaps because they're quite young, which is also very interesting. Um, right, so that's some patterns of floristic composition. There's, uh, there seems to be this floristic coherence or integrity to neotropical dry forests, despite the high compositional variation within them. And so moving on to where dry forests are outside of uh, the Americas, because that's what I think about more uh, now, working a lot in Angola and Namibia. So this was a map uh, published in 2018 by Toby Pennington and Caroline Neyman and Lucy Rowland. And you'll see there's a lot of detail in the neotropics, because again, we have a good idea where the dry forests are in the neotropics. And then outside of the <laughs> neotropics, there's a big blob in the Horn of Africa and a bit maybe in Pakistan and neighboring countries. So where, where did that map come from? Where did those ideas come from? Well, a lot of it comes from some ideas that have been floating around in the legume community for quite a while. So uh, the senior author on this paper, Colin Hughes uh, and Toby Pennington and Brian Schreier, who coined this term succulent biome, which I'll explain right now what it is, uh, are all legume uh, systematists at heart, even if they do a lot of biogeography and interesting evolutionary biology. And they've been talking about these things for a long time. So this paper was just published this year by Jens Ringelberg and, with, and Colin Hughes group in Zurich. And it's a map of the succulent biome. So there's a slight change of language here. And the succulent biome was first put forth in a paper led by Brian Schreier in 2005. And it's the idea that there's this distinct vegetation type in the tropics that's seasonally dry that's full of succulents. So it's seasonally dry, but it doesn't experience fire because as we discussed earlier, succulents don't like fire. And so what Jens did is he, he took the collection information for succulent tree species, so herbarium voucher information for succulents, sorry, not just tree species, succulents in general, but also other lineages that are characteristic of the succulent biome, uh, again, as articulated by Schreier et al. So that includes some legume lineages, some bursaraceae lineages, and uh, and just did species distribution modeling and said, where can these things occur? Where do they like to occur? And just stack those distribution models to, to make a map, a global map of the succulent biome. So we see that this matches pretty well with our, sorry, I'll go to the next slide, with our conception in the neotropics. So um, it, it, where the succulent biome is found in the neotropics largely corresponds to where we're saying the tropical dry forest biome is in the neotropics. Uh, but then it's also in Africa, in this big area in East Africa, in the Horn of Africa, but maybe also in uh, coastal southwest Angola, in Namibia, and this whole area in southeastern Africa and the west side of Madagascar. Yeah. So, are there any floristic studies within Africa to back up this idea? So if we go to Africa and look at who's been doing large-scale ordinations and clusterings of the African flora, I think Peter Linder's work is the, the first one that comes to mind. And he's been doing this kind of work since at least 2005, uh, potentially before. And he published a paper in 2014 where he, so the figure on the right is an ordination not of sites but of occurrences of genera. So each one of those points is a genus rather than a site. But anyways, what it, what it shows is genera that have similar distributions across the African continent. And he identified different groups in there. And there was a forest group, which you can see here. There's a savanna group that overlaps with it a bit, a montane alpine group that I'm not going to talk about very much. And then this arid group that is largely found in the Horn of Africa and coastal Namibia and Angola which corresponds fairly well to the, to the succulent biome, right? So, so it does seem like there's this, this arid flora in Africa uh, that corresponds to, to the succulent biome, which may correspond to the tropical dry forest biome. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So, so but have there been comparative studies? So Peter's study is whole flora, uh, not just trees. Have there been studies of tree biogeography in Africa, similar to what we've been doing in the neotropics? So, 
I was uh, involved in a study in 2015 that started to, to poke at this question a bit, albeit with a not very big data set. But we wanted to see if there was any floristic commonality between dry forests in the neotropics and dry forests, or things that are often called dry forests in Africa and Asia. And, and so we sampled uh, savannas, moist forests, and dry forest formations on different continents, including in Africa, remember woodlands, in Asia, uh, dry evergreen forests, dry dipteropod forests, dry deciduous forests, all these things that people call dry forests. And when we did big clustering analyses based on tree species composition on that data set, we didn't find any common dry forest flora right across the tropics. In fact, uh, different vegetation units in uh, on different continents clustered together, but then tended to cu cluster with other vegetation units from their continent. For example, we see that South American savannas, South American dry forests, and South American moist forests all group together, separate from paleotropical uh, groups. And then the individual dry forests didn't cluster together either, the things that could be called dry forests, which uh, we can talk about later, but a lot of them maybe aren't dry forests because they actually have grassy understories and fern. Anyway, so we didn't find any evidence for a dry forest floristic group definitively. And then in uh, the sort of largest scale study that I know of so far of the tree flora composition of Africa. So this is a paper that's in press uh, led by Julie Alman and Arlene Feol in Belgium. And they looked at a bunch of sites uh, in forest and savanna and different vegetation types in Africa and basically showed that there was uh, two main compositional groups that correspond to forest and savanna. So in this slide, these aren't exactly uh, sites. These are grid squares with herbarium data, but they did also use uh, site-based data in their study. And what they show is that most grid cells in Africa are comprised primarily of forest specialist species or savanna specialist species. And all these uh, grid cells dominated by forest specialist species largely correspond to moist forest. So this is the most comprehensive database on tree species composition at sites in Africa, and it doesn't find this third group of tropical dry forests that we've been finding in the neotropics. So, so what, what's going on here? Um, so it might be instructive to look back at this figure from uh, Jens Ringelberg's paper on the succulent biome. And these are some pictures of the succulent biome to show what it looks like. And when we look at this, uh, we think, well, wait a second. None of this really looks like forest. So is the succulent biome the tropical dry forest biome? Uh, maybe not, I don't know. And then, so I've been thinking about this a lot and I always try to be self-critical and I was thinking back to pictures I saw of tropical dry forest. And so people from a sort of, uh, let's say taxonomic systematics background, biogeography background, and the neotropics are calling this a dry forest, but wouldn't ecologists call this a dry forest? It doesn't have a closed canopy, would they call it a forest? And then, like even worse, some of the places in the Kaitinga that we're calling dry forests, right, would any ecologist call this a dry forest? And so this is something that you know, I'm starting to think about a bit. And, uh, and then, uh, so, so possibly, us working in the neotropics on dry forests are calling some things uh, dry forests that other people might not necessarily call dry forests because it's dominated by the same tree lineages and the same species quite often as the more upright forests that, that most people would call for us. But then also, I think um, maybe using these first definitions has uh, messed us up a bit in, 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 as well. So in Marcelo's paper, I should mention that Giselle de Durigan uh, was the editor of the paper, who was a supervisor to Natasha, who's going to talk uh, next. And she was a very kind editor and eventually let this paper through, but she had some, like, uh, some advice for us <laughs> at various points in there. She should probably be a co-author because she was really helped. But, um, she was saying, well, why aren't you, let Sehadao, which is, uh, Natasha will certainly talk about Sehadao at some point, but this is sort of grown up uh, Sehado that forms a closed canopy and actually is, is quite resistant to disturbance. They've done some experiments where they try to burn it down and they can't, they cannot burn it down. And it's behaving like a forest. So why isn't that a tropical dry forest? So it's certainly floristically distinct from, from tropical dry forests, but uh, as we're calling them, but it's, uh, so it's compositionally distinct, but it is behaving like a forest. It's seasonally dry, so why is it not a tropical dry forest? So maybe using these floristic approaches, we've also been too exclusionary of some forest formations. So these are the things that keep me up at night, what I think about, um, well, also small children, but anyways. Uh, so 
I guess the main takeaways for me, uh, one that I've been arguing for a while now, is that transitions from savanna to forest are really distinct for moist forests and dry forests. So I don't think we can really put moist forests and dry forests in the same box. So we, we need to be careful about that. And then in terms of biogeographic conundrums, uh, Yadvinder has already talked about one, but why is there a dry forest forest agreement in the neotropics in Latin Africa? Or one could ask that why are there really arid Af areas in Africa? Why do they not have a distinct tree flora? They do seem to have a distinct flora, but it's not full of trees. And then the last thing is, where do we draw the lines around the tropical dry forest box? What is tropical dry forest and what isn't? And I don't know if we can answer that question, and it may really depend on what your goals are, actually. So maybe there is just, it's always context dependent, but it would be nice to me. Anyway, so I'll leave it at that. I'll say thanks to a lot of people. Um, I've been working on a lot of these questions with Toby Pennington over the years, um, and there's various other people who deserve credit. Uh, various research networks like Dry Forum, Seesaw, Seiko, you don't know about yet. That's a newly funded NERC grant to study the biogeography and ecosystem function of the dry tropics. Uh, and thanks to a lot of students and postdocs and a lot of funders. And with that, I will stop and hand back over to Alvaro, I think. Hey, Kyle. Thank you very much for this wonderful and inspiring talk. We really thank you. It was really, really great. So guys, remember to send questions. If you have any questions through the Q&A tab, please. If you have questions uh, either for Carl or David or Natasha, who is coming now, please send it through the Q&A tabs uh, and they are gonna be two at the end of the talks. So now it's time to introduce our third speaker, Natasha Pylon. Natasha got her master's degree and PhD in ecology at the University of Campinas in Brazil and was supervised by Giselda Durigan. Her master focused on restoration techniques to recover the Cerrado ground layer in the graded sites. Her PhD focused on the effects of natural disturbances in the structure and dynamics of open vegetation types in Sorara. She is currently associated as postdoc with Zelda Durigan and Rafael Oliveira Rishi groups, investigating how environmental factors and frequency of disturbances can shape the structure and composition of open vegetation in Cerrado. She also aims to look for general traits to properly characterize the conservation status, status of this ecosystem. So Natasha, it's a pleasure to have, to have you here, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, let's try to share my screen here. Well, oops, it's working? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Ah, thank you. Let's, let's think. So first, I would like to thank you uh, for the invitation to be part of this webinar. Uh, I'm really happy to, to be here and talk about the role of fire, frost, and fire suppression as drivers of the tropical savanna structure. So, um, in the Cerrado, as Kyle told, uh, introduced, we can find a mosaic of vegetation types. And in a few kilometers, we can find uh, landscapes like this, and we can cross, if you, we take this road, we can cross a grassland vegetation type, a dense savanna, and maybe in the rope this road in a forest-like vegetation, like this, that we call Cerradão. So, uh, this kind of vegetation mosaics is not common only in, in Cerrado, but in other savannas around the world. And this vegetation mosaics in tropical savannas is mainly determined by a set of environmental factors or a set of disturbances, all these both set together. And in the talk, I will focus uh, my presentation in two disturbances. The, the frequency of the frost and also the frequency of the fire as natural disturbances shaping the vegetation structure. And okay, but this knowledge uh, about these two disturbances is mainly constructed in, in a tree-oriented uh, vision. It's based in the tree layer. So we know that 
uh, in a short interval to, to summarize this knowledge a lot because it's a quite a complex process. But to summarize it, we know that in a short interval without frost or in a short interval without fire, uh, we can see some three individuals colonizing the landscape, the open savannas. However, if the fire or frost returns to the system, then some uh, these young trees will die or they will trap it in a fire trap zone or in a frost trap zone where they can uh, lose their aerial part after the disturbances, but they can grow sprout several times after these disturbances. So they are not able to grow, but they will be there with sprouting and be in, in this trap zone. However, in a long interval, without frost or without fire, these uh, three individuals can grow beyond this trap zone and they can change the vegetation structure for a more closed, closed, <laughs> closed canopy vegetation like this. And in this state, um, the vegetation with more closed canopy um, and a more tree uh, cover the probability of it burn and out also the frost effects will be really reduced. Because of this, uh, fire and frost are considered to have similar effects shaping the vegetation community. However, we don't know what happened to, to the other layer in Savona, the ground layer, the, the most species rich, in, uh, rich layer in the Savona vegetation. So we really don't know what happened to the to this layer after a frost or after fire or even after a fire suppression. We see this change in the vegetation structure, but we not don't know what's going on in the floor. For example, we know that in 50 years of fire suppression, a open vegetation like this can change for a closed kind of vegetation like this. But if we look to the floor, what happened to the ground layer to all these species here that disappeared? So what's the ground layer dynamics in the absence of the fire? How long does it take for typical species to leave the system? And what is the threshold to avoid the change of state from an open vegetation type to a closed canopy one? And is there a threshold? We can find this threshold to avoid the loss of the open vegetation types. So I put this joke here. I will keep calling along the presentation uh, the ground layer process and dynamics as a black box because we don't really know what's going on there. And other example of black box uh, regarding to the ground layer is for Tavana, we know that fire consumes the, the ground layer really quick. So the ground layer is actually the fuel for fire spread. But in three months, everything is beautiful and green again. So what makes the ground layer so resilient to fire? Which regeneration strategies uh, make this quick recovery? And is it really resilient? We don't know this yet. We know that everything is green again, but is it really resilient? Everything is there after uh, fire consumes the entire ground layer. We also don't know. And about the second disturbances that I want to talk today, uh, will frost have this fire-like uh, effect on the savanna ground layer? As predicted for the wood layer, we also don't know in how this question is really interesting to investigate. So I think it's time to combine the, the new knowledge on what is already known about the tree layer with the ground layer uh, new knowledge that we need to develop to understand the system as a whole because it's time to improve the restoration techniques regarding to the open ecosystems in savanna and also we need to develop conservation actions for these open physiognomies and also focus in in specific targets so we we need to understand to look inside these black boxes and try to understand the the other types of growth forms in, in Cerrado, in tropical savannas. And to contribute to this challenge, we have studied the ground layer at Santa Barbara Ecological Station, where fire has been suppressed since the 70s. So in this dot here, we can see our study site that is in Sao Paulo State. 
in the really Australian niche of the Cerrado distribution. And here's the entire Cerrado distribution in Brazil. And here in this Australian niche, the frost is quite common. So we have a frost this year. And because of the Santa Barbara Ecological Station, it's a good place to investigate the effect of, uh, of the fire, of the frost, and also uh, the effects of the, the fire suppression. And I will try to, to summarize our main results. So let's begin with uh, what happened to the ground layer in a fire suppression scenario. We monitor the vegetation in open savanna and also in a more dense savannas along the uh, four years. And uh, it's really interesting and surprisingly that only four years we find uh, really, we found really significant results. So we saw a increase in density and also in richness of generalist species, trees and climbers. This here is the percentage of increase uh, by year. And we also saw a reduction in grass cover, no grasses, and bio soil, thinking the structure of the, the ground layer. And I would like to stress here that it's a really, um, it's a problem, this reduction in the grass, because the grass is the component that keeping the open, the dynamics of the open physiognomies, and also the component that characterizes uh, the tropical savanna. And I would like to stress uh, here also the climbers increase. So climbers is not quite common. I think it's not really common agrofarming farming in open cerrado uh, types of open cerrado vegetation. So we understand this increase in climbers and also the reduction in the, the grasses as a degradation process, as the beginning of the, the loss of the properties of the open physiognomies in, in Cerrado, in, in our study site. And as we monitor the, the vegetation dynamics in open savannas and also in more dense savannas, we could compare, uh, compare the, the, the dynamics in these two vegetation types. So we saw uh, that the abundance of savanna specialists increase in the open savannas and in more dense savannas, this component reduces. So here we saw a uh, accumulation in the savannas, uh, especially the species. And in more dense savannas, we, we saw a reduction in this uh, specialist species. For the richness of forests, generalist species, and also climbers, we saw an increase in both open savannas and also dense savannas but the increase in the dense savannas was uh, greater. So for these uh, variables here, the dynamics was different in open savannas and more dense one. Regarding to the grass cover, this really, really important uh, component for the, the, the vegetation dynamics, the savanna dynamics, we saw a decrease in both vegetation types. However, um, I would like to stress here that in these dense savannas, we, we have um, less than 25% of the grass cover. So it's a really uh, sparse grass cover. So in, in these dense savannas, the, the grass layer, it's not more, it's not continuous anymore. And this is really important to think about when we are trying to, to set targets and, and actions for conservation. For example, uh, I think not, like, with these results, uh, fire management should be applied while the vegetation is still open, where we have more than 50% of the grass cover before the loss of the, the grass layer continuity, because then we can use the fire to keep this vegetation as an open ecosystem. And also here in these open vegetation types, we saw that uh, this uh, this plot still preserves the richness of typical species and also the functioning of uh, these open ecosystems. And I bring here this plot from Newberry et al. that uh, have um, studied the flammability and the probability of the fire along this vegetation gradient in the same uh, ecological station that us. And they saw a reduction in the probability of ignition and also a reduction in the fire spread as the vegetation becomes more dense. So here's the left R index for the canopy cover. 
then I, I think it, this is really important results because we have to apply the fire management before the vegetation uh, changes for a more dense vegetation with less, uh, with less grass cover. And we have to apply the fire management while the vegetation is still have uh, a grass cover that allow the fire spread. Okay, but what happens to the ground layer after a prescribed fire? As I said, this vegetation has been protected from fire since the 70s. So in the more open vegetation types like this in the, in the ecological station, we have some accidental fires, some wild fires in the last decade, but really, really sparse events in the time. I think one or two wild fire happened in this plot. So uh, this vegetation is still resilient to, to fire after a long time without burning. We performed that prescribed fire in the open patches in the ecological station where the grass layer is still uh, a continuous layer and we monitor the vegetation before and after the fire and we find a uh, really good result so uh, the, the ground layer this, this open uh, patch is still extremely resilient to fire in only eight months 85 percent of the species recovery the abundance previous, previous to fire and this recovery was mainly due to sprouts from specialized in underground structures. We dig out the plants, it was a really nice uh, work to do, and, but I will not have time to go in details about this, but maybe it's uh, closer to 90% of the species are, are able to sprout. And some of them recover the, the, the population size by seeds, the species not able to sprout, but they can, um, germinated after five. And 13% uh, of the species increases the abundance. So we have this increase mainly by vegetative propagation and also some few species able to germinate. And only 1% of the species, this, this species, of the species, sorry, decreases the, the abundance. And this was the least, uh, because of only one Huderoi species. So this is a really good and great result to preserve these open vegetation types that are uh, protected from, from fire. And we also monitored the, the ground layer uh, structure by monitoring the vegetation cover of fire soil, uh, grasses and non grasses, no grasses, uh, such as shrubs, forbs, and some shrubs. And we saw that um, in a few months after fire, there is this huge increase in bar soil and the decrease in the vegetation cover. Then with the time, we return it to closer to the values before fire. But the important result that I want to highlight here is that this, um, this moment, these few months after fire, with this increase in bar soil, it's a really great moment for the ecology of the ground layer because in this moment the species will use it out this window of resources like um, a body space, a light, and also nutrients from ash deposition to open uh, fruits and disseminate species by the, the landscape uh, seeds uh, adapted to fly. Uh, we also saw a, this massive and beautiful and synchronic bloom and so species use it in moments to, to produce flowers and also new fruits in the, the system. And also some species able to be germinated. And this is really great because germination for uh, savanna species, total savanna species, it's a really interesting topic to study nowadays. And we really don't know how these seeds work. And it's a great opportunity to, to research. So we also saw that it, all these, um, these window of opportunities, all these changes in the vegetation structures lead to um, an increase in the number of species per meter square if compared with before fire, and also an increase in the, um, the number of individuals per meter square. So 
this is a great result a result and yes after fire even after a long period uh, of the fire suppression the the vegetation is still keeps the resilience the the components that make the the system resilient and okay but what happens to the ground layer after frost we saw that some uh, fire effects and also what happens to the ground layer uh, after a fire suppression uh, period and okay but what about the frost we get really lucky because uh, we are monitoring the vegetation when the a frost happens in our study site uh, it, it this event allowed us, us to compare the vegetation before and after frosty and this is a really great opportunity for one ecologist that wants to look the effects of the frost so i try to summarize the the main results in this slide uh, we get really excited about this process so we monitor the effects of the frost in the entire vegetation mosaic from the the more open uh, grassland here uh, at, um, and uh, in the also in the forest like vegetation to say hatam and in this ordination here i put the main damage made by made in the species made by frost in each species so the lines here represent the left area index of the canopy to give you an idea about the structure of the vegetation along of the gradient and the colors represent the different ground performance and the size of the circles represents the damage made by frost in the species that we registered. So zero is uh, zero effects, no damage made by frost. One is leave it partially burdened by frost. And two, it's more than 50% of the, the individuals um, was burned or lost of it, more than 50% of the aerial part. And three is a uh, topic you completely lost of the aerial part. And in this plot here, <laughs> this is so clear that the, the frost, uh, the effects of the frost is more pronunciated in the open vegetation types. So with, if you think about the first, the second, I think third slide that I show, uh, about the similarity of the frost and fire effects, so yes, Frost and fire has similar effects regarding to the effects along the uh, along the vegetation gradient, thinking the damage made by species. So, as frost, fire also are more pronunciated in the open vegetation types in Cerrado. As Caio said, we tried to burn a lot the Cerradão, but <laughs> we not uh, it was not possible. Okay, we also monitored some other variables. Uh, for example, we saw that the density of savanna specialists is reduced um, in 15% after three months after frost. We also uh, registered a decrease in grasses, no grasses, and bare soil, and a huge increase in litter. So just take a look at in this picture. This picture I made, I think, one month after, uh, before frost. And here we have a three months after frost and everything is really brown and we have a lot of uh, dead biomass. And I organized here this slide to try to compare the main effects of the, the, the fire, the frost and also fire suppression, um, shaping the structure of the ground layer and, and um, we can see here that let's start with this first uh, fire and frost right because it's um it's predicted to have the same effect so we saw that fire uh, decreases uh, the grass cover and also frost decreases the grass cover however we saw that uh, after fire there was an increase in bare soil and the frost promotes the decrease in bare soil fire promotes the increase in litter and the frost promotes the increase in litter. And also after fire, we saw an increase in the abundance of the savanna specialists. Remember that plot with the increase in density if compared with before fire. And the frost decreases the abundance of savanna specialists. So if we do a match in these colors here, 
frost effects will be more similar to the fire, fire effects than to the <laughs> to the fire suppression effects than to the fire effects. And this is really interesting because it's quite different uh, from the literature for the wood layer. I bring here some pictures to, to show to you what happens three months after a frost. We can see some top kill right here. And here uh, I put to, uh, with a zoom to the floor. And there is a lot of dead biomass and little bar soil. And here it's three months after fire. So to me, this is really beautiful. And we have here everything green. Uh, here's a close to the, to the floor. And all the species flowering, a lot of species flowering, a few litter and bar soil. That is a really important. Uh, thing for the dynamics of the ground layer. So it's important to understand that although um, like fire, frost is more intense in open physiognomy leading to top kill and death of some three individuals. The effects of the frost on the structure of the ground layer can be antagonist to the effects of the fire in some extension. And to try to put everything together, not talk only about the ground layer, not talk only about the field layer, but put all the pieces together. Uh, we, we know now that in an interval without fire, we will see some decreasing bar soil, increasing litter. This amount of dead biomass will lead to a high intensity fire. And uh, after this high intensity fire, we will saw some Increasing top Q, mortality of some three individuals, increasing by soil and litter. The species specialists in Savannah will uh, get crazy. They will love this <laughs> high intensity fire, probably. And they will withdraw from the underground structure. Some of these species uh, will germinate. We will saw this massively bloom and the input of new seeds in the system because of this massively bloom. And so the increase in the abundance of savanna specialists. So all these uh, together will lead to um, uh, uh, keeping the open savanna ecosystem in the in the landscape. However, in an interval without fire and in a scenario of the fire suppression, uh, we will see a increase in uh, a decrease in bar soil and increase in litter. Uh, a set of generalist species colonizing the, the landscape, the increase in trees, in clingers, and also in canopy cover. All these changes will lead to an increase in shade and then the exclusion of C4 grasses of the system. And these C4 grasses are really important because they, they are the component that is the most important component to keep the, the fire feedbacks working and keeping the system as an open ecosystem. So, with the exclusion of the C4 grass clover, we can end up in a part like vegetation, like Cerradão here. Uh, and, and where the, in places that the climate conditions and also the soil conditions allow this amount of the biomass. And in about frost, what about frost? Uh, where we can put frost in this general uh, schedule? So to me, frost came in here. After a frost, we will see a decreasing bar soil and a huge amount of litter, and also some top kill of uh, young trees. However, the future of the system uh, will largely depend in the probability or not of a high intensity fire or fire suppression. So frost alone will be not able to keep the system as a savanna open ecosystem. And um, I would like to, to finish my presentation, not with a conclusion, because I think there is a lot to understand uh, about the ground layer. So there is a lot of black boxes to look inside. And I put here some questions to instigate you to look to the floor. So what is the dynamics of the ground layer in a fire suppression scenario in drier areas, drier than our area, or in shallower soils, or in soils with water saturation? And what are the post-fire regeneration strategies under these uh, different conditions? And here, really interesting, 
Uh, do the trends fund for the Cerrado differ from other savannas in the world? And this question is really interesting. And so the ground layer is an um, open field for new researches. And there is only way to see inside these blocks, these black boxes. It's um, looking to the floor. So I finished my talking. Uh, come to let's go to the field when it's safe again. And I would like to thank you for your attention and put here some pictures of our team and also a leaf of grasses with some ice to prove that there is frost in the tropical savanna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. That was just wonderful. And I agree, let's all go to the field again when it's safe. Um, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to reiterate that if you have questions for any or all of our panelists, um, please um, submit them to the Q&A. Um, Alvaro and I will be um, asking the questions of the panelists. So we will reiterate what questions you all put uh, into the, the Q&A. Um, I'll start off with, with one of the questions, and this is sort of a, I don't know if it's a practical or a philosophical question for, for all the panelists. Uh, the first question we got was, when is a forest a forest? And you can take turns answering. Okay. Uh, well, I can kick off. Uh, well, I think I think uh, Kyle sort of picked up on this, uh, and that we uh, actually have a variety of definitions of forest, and perhaps the one that's the most conventional is a structural one about some type of closed canopy, you know, where where a system has a a closed enough canopy that it, you don't get a grassy understory and don't get the, the fire and natural fire dynamics get suppressed. But it's interesting, as Kyle pointed out, that. Uh, if we go for a compositional definition of forest, we, we run into slightly different boundaries and slightly, slightly different terms. Uh, so uh, where there's, there are lineages that are very common to forests that are found outside of the structural forest biome. So, and I would tend to lean towards a structural definition, but I can be convinced that some sort of compositional approach is required yes, in some cases as well. As I, as I started thinking about this uh, more, um, how do we define these things? One thing that I thought about was thinking of a, a sort of field grind view of the world and thinking about what limits the, the trees in the system. And so is it disturbance that limits the number of trees in the system or is it competition amongst trees? So maybe that's another way to think about it, that uh, forests are where trees are the ones limiting the number of trees and they can be less dense or more dense. So in these dry forest systems, the trees can be sparse, but it's not, uh, it's not disturbance limiting number of the trees, it's just resources. So, so maybe it's tree competition, is that the limit? Or in savannas or other systems, it's a disturbance, be it fire or animals or frost or humans or what have you. So that's another way to sort of pick at it a bit, I think. I'll let Natasha say her word. Wow, this is really difficult question. Um, and <laughs> I, I think, for example, I will take for uh, example our Caatinga, as Caio showed in the, in, the, in the presentation. We don't know where to put Caatinga in, the, in Brazil. <laughs> Actually, we have a lot of studies, um, a lot of, the, I think, also in the government uh, classification of the vegetation types in Brazil. We put Caatinga as a savanna, but we don't have the grasses. We put Caatinga as a dry forest, but it, for me, I, I don't know. To me, I think a forest it has a, that structure with a closed canopy and a lot of shade and not bare soil and a lot of light in, uh, reaching the ground. So maybe we need the other name for this uh, forest, you know, forest stuff. I don't know. To me, it's a really difficult question. But I really don't like to call savanna as forest. So savanna is not forest to me at all. 
Okay, Kyle, I think you have uh, one question for you. It's for Johan Pelletier. Can you read it? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah I saw the question. Yeah, sorry, what is the Miombo? So yeah, I'm, I'm starting to work in, in Miombo a fair bit. So, uh, so that's collaborating with Casey Ryan. So that's a, a fair question. So I'm starting to think about it. Miombo might very well be its own beast. Um, it, it, it's a really interesting vegetation. Uh, it, and it maybe it fits in that biogeographic conundrum box. It's, a, it's dominated by EM species, so ectomycorrhizal tree species. These are these deterioid legumes that used to be called sesalconioid legumes, um, such as Brachistia ginger bernardia. So there's some commonalities with our Bornean dipterocarp forest there. But um, yeah, I don't know if there's an equivalent uh, vegetation in the neotropics in dry areas where you have vegetation dominated by EM species. So, so maybe, like globally, Miombo is a bit its own thing. But I, but I would argue that Miombo shows a lot of variation. So there is more open Miombo where there is a big grassy understory and it burns a lot. But they, then it can get closed canopy for sure and approach a forest. So, I mean, it's easy to compositionally identify. Uh, so if we're using compositional definitions, it's easy to call it its own thing. Um, but if you're using uh, ecosystem function data, and ultimately, like I guess that's what this session is about, and and that's those are the categories we're often trying to draw. Draw, I guess, or what are the main boxes in terms of ecosystem function? And I think Yadvinder's group's doing a lot of work on that. But how does Miombo ecosystem function compared to forest or savannas? And it might very well depend on the the standard Miombo you're looking at. In other words, uh, <laughs> is it a grown up? forest like Miombo, or is it one that's had disturbance recently? But um, yeah, so I think it's a tricky thing. Compositionally distinct, uh, and then if we had to put it in the, the forester savanna box, uh, it's a bit tricky. Yeah, That's a kind of a dodge, sorry, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not, I don't know enough about it yet to say where it goes. You know, yeah, Vinder and Natasha, I'll invite you to respond to this too, uh, if, if, if you want. I confess I'm not that familiar with the Miombo, so I don't really have any particular uh, ins insights on that particular point. But uh, I, may, I may come back to Kyle just on, on the previous point about this disturbance-based definition of forest, which I, mean, I think I think is intriguing. Uh, and there was a bit in the question there, they, they gave an example of a boreal forest, uh, obviously, which, which has a heavy disturbance regime around fire, but we still characterize that as a forest. Maybe. Is that because the return time is so infrequent that it does it in between disturbances it, it, grow, it grows to a, an, a closed canopy system that is not disturbance controlled? Uh, yeah, I guess it, won't, it maybe it depends on the scale, eh? Like, um, because when the, the boreal forest burns down and you see this landscape full of stumps, nobody calls that a forest, right? Yes. When it grows back, they call it a forest. So is it, um, you have these stand destroying fires. So fire regimes are obviously highly variable, right? So, um, so maybe in a, like the Cejado or the Miombo where fire goes through, clears off the understory, kills some trees, but some trees stay. It's not this whole physiognomy altering fire. Whereas a boreal forest switches the state, if you will, when it has a fire and it becomes a forest again. But yeah, certainly we, the boreal forest biome, we put that box on the whole thing, even though parts of it aren't, uh, aren't forest in a given uh, moment. But um, yeah, maybe it's just the, the scale at which the, the fire destroys things, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's a fair question from, uh, um, from sorry, I just have to get the name right, Johan. I, they're disappearing. But anyway, your, yeah. Johan, how do you pronounce your name? I don't know. Anyway, yeah, Johan, let's say, or Johanna. Sorry, there's more questions coming in, so I'll go back to Jennifer. Thanks, I'll ask the next one. Um, this is uh, for Natashi. A um, couple of questions. Nice talk. I was not aware of, a, of fire suppression happening in these systems. Is this a common management practice? Do we have any idea of the relative proportion of natural versus anthropogenic fires in these savannas? Right. In, in Brazil and also in other savannas around the world, they start, but in, in Brazil it's quite common. Uh, the management action is to protect uh, all the all the mosaics of Cerrado, all the 
conservation units, uh, we have to protect them from, from fire. And this started in Brazil in 70. So we have a lot of vegetation in, for example, in Sao Paulo State, where it is more um, humid. We have a lot of, we already lost a lot of open physiognomies because of these fire suppression policies in Brazil. And now we are trying to, to do some fire management and in some, in some units in, in Brazil, because we understand that we need to burn and not only to preserve these, these, these open vegetation types, but also to, to avoid um, high intensity fires and the, the wild fires that we are seeing this year. So a lot of the fires that happened this year in Brazil, I don't know if you are aware, it, we, it, we are suffering this because of the loss uh, of um, a fire management previous to, to reach this high amount of biomass and this really dry year that we are living in Brazil this year. So we are learning, learning suffering the consequences of wildfires and also of loss of important uh, biodiversity. Uh, one question for you, Jadinder, that we have here. How can we better incorporate below ground processes into our understanding of how tropical ecosystems function? Okay. Uh, well, one the part, part of that is certainly measuring them. You know, compared, I think below ground processes get neglected compared to above ground. There is more work digging things up. It's harder to track over time, changes over time. Uh, but wherever they're studied, they're found to be hugely significant. So in a forest biome, you know, we see what we're proposing in my, in my talk is that the difference in the, in the growth rate and structure of Borneo versus South America versus Amazonia is driven by below ground processes by mycorrhizal associations is, is our hypothesis that's striking huge differences in biomes and biogeographic differences. Uh, and also in the savannas, you know, there, there's, there's a wealth of literature showing the, uh, how in some ways that much of the biome's activity is below ground. And, uh, and uh, in many cases, the drier biomes, the above ground is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of ecosystem function and competition. Uh, so measurement, I think, is, is a key part of it. And once we have measurements, developing uh, coherent models and theories. I think part of the challenge also can be that we don't think of the system as a whole, that there are people who study roots in detail. They tend to st study just the below ground processes. There are people who study above ground processes in, in detail. And we don't often try and build, bring them together into a single framework to understand things like allocation or strategies overall, because take, that requires a lot more work. So, uh, uh, so no easy answer there, apart from yes, we need to, to include, measure them and study them and understand the mechanisms and bring them together in a single theoretical fr framework and uh, as the above ground system. Thank you, Jadide. Thanks so much. Um, I'm gonna address another question from the audience to Kyle, but um, I think any of our panelists can jump in. Um, as an ecologist, I think the floristic approach to defining ecological units is worthwhile and exciting. I would certainly question that your TDF floristic unit should be called a forest, um, as that just confuses some important ecological concepts. But I'm certain that we have these formations in Africa and would be fascinated to know how floristically distinct they are. As we, do have, um, as we do have high soil fertility savannas in Africa, is it possible that our TDF flora are not as distinct as those in South America? Yeah, there's a, a, lot, a lot of stuff in there and it also ties to the next question that I can see but maybe the audience couldn't, can't see. So I'll address maybe Sally and Ima's question at the same time, uh, perhaps. But Ima Oliveras has a question after Sally Archibald. So, um, yeah, so this has been a bit of a personal journey for me, Sally, in the sense that I come from a sort of more systematic biogeography ge background. And so I think floristically, and you know, I've been contributing the papers and leading a couple of papers, like pushing this idea of the tropical dry forest biome from the neotropics. Of course, I'm not the first one to do that, right? I'm not claiming ownership of that. But 
I, now, like the more I interact with ecosystem ecologists like Yadvinder and yourself and so on, uh, I think I might have messed up a bit. Like, <laughs> so um, I'm slightly worried about this floristic approach we've been pushing in. We are putting these things that an African would call thicket or bushland into the forest box. And so maybe um, that's not quite right. So it's, it's, I'm very much, I'm not sure right now. I'm trying to figure this out myself, the answer to these questions. But in terms of uh, where it is in Africa, um, so I think you do have these high soil fertility savannas in Africa. A big thing that we haven't talked about is why these uh, biogeographic conundrums happen. And maybe I stole that word from you, uh, sorry. But, uh, but um, and animals comes into play here, obviously. So in Africa, you have a lot of animals attracted to eat those leaves in high fertility areas and are knocking down trees and perhaps contributing to keeping the ecosystem open when fire cannot do so. Again, uh, Sally Archibald asked this question, has published papers on this. Um, so, so maybe the big herbivores are absent from neotropics and so that stuff goes up into thicket and forest and, uh, and, and doesn't look like a savanna. So, so I think there's a lot of interesting things to think about there. Um, and whether animals knocking down trees contributes to the lack of a distinct TDF tree flora, I don't know, but it's worth thinking about. In terms of Ema's question, uh, this definition of forest in the Albany thickets in the Eastern Cape. So I haven't been in those, but I've read about them. And it gets into this uh, question of is thicket, bushland, etc., areas where um, it's not quite an upright forest, but there's not regular fire, is that a dry forest? And that's a bit the crux of the question. Um, I know John Lloyd organized uh, a workshop conference, what have you, in the UK a few years ago that I couldn't make, but it brought together a bunch of researchers from the dry tropics. And they thought maybe one of their conclusions, which I don't think is published yet, but um, was that maybe we should hive off bushlands and thickets as a separate biome. And so basically take all the stuff that we're calling dry forest in the tropics, neotropics, and split it in two, and put half of it in a dry forest box, and the other half goes to the bushland thicket biome. And that should be a separate thing. So these are the things that we're calling dry forest in the neotropics, but don't have closed canopy. Or it could be the Albany thickets in Africa, or a lot of the stuff in uh, the Horn of Africa, or in uh, Northwest Namibia, Southwest Angola. So I don't know, this is all in flux. And that, that's why I think, ultimately, I think the boxes are going to depend on um, who's drawing them and why they want to have the boxes, how to draw them. But I should stop talking because I'm dominating the airtime. So yeah, I'll hand over. Thank you, Kyle. I think you already answered also well the, the following question. So now there is an, an anonymous attendee who is asking, is there any consensual holistic definition of forest? Uh, that say, for instance, including all about mentioned parameters, maybe any reference is his question. I don't know, you guys. Well, I think uh, there are, definitions, but I think what our debate has been about is actually questioning that and showing that the more closely you look at forests, the more complicated the story becomes that uh, at the boundaries of, uh, we could go for the structural one that I talked about earlier on. Um, if you go to the FAO or something, it's purely a parameter based one about a certain height and a certain canopy cover. That's fine, that provides you a, con a convenient definition just for practicality. But uh, if we're interested as an ecologist in trying to understand what makes a forest a forest and what makes other biomes not a forest and then it becomes a little bit murky uh, uh, where, where the boundaries are and I think that's where the fascinating ecology is you know what, what's constraining and limiting the structure of, the, of, of a system. I don't know uh, going back to Kyle's response from earlier I, I tend to agree that, that the use of the word forest and uh, for the seasonally dry tropical forest is, is looking like it's getting problematic now but initially it made a lot of sense because it extends across the structural definition uh, and beyond. So uh, now whether you want to do further splitting as you proposed or, or other ways of looking at that is an open question, but it's, it's, it's intriguing. Thanks, I'm gonna ask the next question. Um, it was asked to Kyle, but I think all of our panelists could, could field this question. And the question is, is it possible to project whether an existing biome may transition to tropical dry forests under a changing climate? Um, what information is needed to make such a projection? 
uh, projection, but I think we could really think about um, all of the biomes that uh, all of the uh, biomes or forest types that you of how or savannas uh, have discussed um, today and 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 think about this question of, um, of what information you need. Um, can we predict these these transitions under a rapidly changing world. I can have a, have a go first. Uh, uh, I think it partly goes back to what's meant by tropical dry forest in that uh, question. If we're going for this, this taxonomic uh, biogeographic definition in terms of composition, that's a slow process that requires species turnover, demographic turnover, uh, etc. which uh, you know, perhaps we can get insights from, from current biogeography, from, from also paleo studies, etc. about the rates at which demographic turnover can cause species ranges to expand. So you know, we, we could expect species that do well in dry forest environments ex expanding into what are currently human, humid forest uh, environments. <coughs> I think if we're thinking about, say, climate change, we're not really, uh, in the 21st century, we're not really just looking that much at demographic turnover. I think we're looking much more at structural shifts or structural collapse where, say, in the case of, the, of a humid forest like the Amazon, whether climate change is enough to allow for something like a new fire regime to appear. And so what happens there tends to be not a huge turn in comp turnover in composition to a different biome, but a shift in the, in the structure and the relative composition of, 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 of different species. And I think in some ways, the, it is quite possible to project that. I think studies have come a long way, a mixture of field studies and modeling studies looking at uh, observing how, for example, fire incidents in the Amazon is causing structural shifts in, in previously fire intolerant systems. Uh, uh, it, it captures how it is possible to, 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 to understand the, those, the, the structural changes. Yeah, I think there will be, um, thinking about, uh, Jan Pender is more of an expert on climate change than I am, so I'll have to be a bit careful here. But, uh, but the, in terms of the changes that will happen, there, there will be like shifts in abundance and stands. So it doesn't have to be like wholesale replacement of species, but even in uh, many areas of the Amazon, not necessarily in the heart of the Amazon in Northern Peru, let's say, or, uh, or Ecuador, but around the fringes or even areas well within the Amazon where I started my research career in Southern Peru, there's a lot of taxa that are deciduous in that forest. There are saber trees that lose their leaves in the dry season. And I think uh, as things get drier, they'll just do slightly better you know, if things get tired, let's say. And, uh, and so there will be like subtle shifts that play out over a while, but what can happen fairly quickly in composition in terms of shifts in abundance, because a lot of, I guess the point is there's a lot of tree species that can deal with drier climates that occur in well of the Amazon anyway. So I, if things dry, I bet there'll be some like shifts in maybe not species disappearing, but there'll be shifts in who's dominant in those stands. We saw a bit of that with uh, Esquivel Mulbert's paper in GCB in 2019. Um, Adriani Esquivel Mulbert had a paper showing we're starting to see some of these compositional shifts. So in terms of like uh, what biome transitions might happen, so if the Amazon gets drier, it could flip to a savanna. There are certainly studies suggesting that. It could shift to just a slightly more seasonal forest with more deciduous species doing a bit better. But uh, what information is needed? Yeah, there's it is a complicated picture. You have to know the current composition. You have to know which things are going. You have to deal with uncertainty. I think Yad Vendor did, dealt with that a bit more. But then the other thing that um, is really the next question is we can't forget about increasing CO2 concentrations because that's a big part of the story. Um, so maybe I won't answer that quite yet. We'll give Natasha a chance to go after this question first before I uh... Thank you, Caio. Uh, this is a really interesting question. And think about savanna. So we are seeing here in Brazil, the Cerrado changing really quick. Uh, where I live the, in, in the south, near the austral limit of Cerrado, the changes are really quick. So we have this increase in, in wood biomass and the change of the, the state. So from our open savanna to a closed canopy vegetation like Cerrado, and Cerradão is a really weird thing because some, here in São Paulo, Cerradão is a set of generalist species. We don't have, a, we have for a short period some species, some wood species of savanna inside the Cerradão, 
but with time these species are not able to to germinate to colonize to propagate in shade so we will have these weird forests with only generalist species and uh, in some places we can see maybe this Cerradão change for um, a, a seasonal dry forest and in some places with more warm climate and more humid areas in Sao Paulo state for example but if we think in the Cerrado core area where it's more drier and the dry season it's longer we have maybe this process happened, but in a slow rate than here in Sao Paulo and the Minas. But it's, it's important to understand that the, this change in Cerrado, this wood encroachment process, is happened in the entire savanna system, in the entire Cerrado uh, distribution, even in the more drier areas closer to the, the Caatinga. So yes, we, ha we are seeing these changes, and I don't know, I think the, the Cerradão structure or a forest-like vegetation will not happen in some places, but maybe uh, the change will be in the loss of the, the, the grass uh, layer and uh, in a vegetation with more shrubs and some small trees. Uh, but yeah, we are changing the, the, the Cerrado vegetation really quick. And here in Sao Paulo, uh, burned every four years or five years that it's more uh, recommended to do, it's not uh, enough to, um, to control these changes. So we are seeing some ecological stations here that these uh, frequency of burn for five years of interval without burn, it's not uh, sufficient to, to control the wood encroachment. So, I don't know, it's happening, it's quick, and uh, we, we are trying to understand what the, the reasons why it's so quick now, and maybe the, I don't know, the changes in, in the climate, but we, we are losing the Cerrado really quick, and we have it to figure out what, what to do before we lost the species. Well, uh, okay, guys, I think uh, we are running out, out of time right now, so there, there is one minute for each one of you just to wrap up uh, this wonderful session of thoughts, so let us to know what do you think as a very brief conclusion on what do you think about the main topics, the, the main talks and the main topics that were addressed today. And thank you to you all guys, and go ahead please right now one by one. Okay, maybe I'll, we'll keep in sequence, so I'll start first. Uh, okay, well, absolutely fascinating. I've really enjoyed this, this range of thinking across the different biomes, but also in very different approaches from the very mega geographic to very detailed studies of, a, of, of the Cerrado system uh, and, and different tool, the tools have arisen. But I think one thing that it really highlights to me is the diversity of tropical biomes, both within the biomes as well, within the forest system, there's so many different types of tropical forest, uh, there's so many different types of dry forest and, uh, and savanna. And sometimes we lose that in our oversimplistic sort of representation, this is how a forest works, this is how a savanna works. And I think that this is just a lovely illustration of that, the, the endless complexity and diversity of biomes within the biome. Now, I also really enjoyed it. I learned a lot, so thanks a lot, Yadendra and Natasha, uh, for, for your talks. Um, yeah, I suppose one thing that I think about is just the, the need for more comparative studies across biomes and across continents. So Yadvinder are starting to do, lead some of that kind of work and people are contributing to Jim, and that's great. And it's just uh, the more I like start working in Africa and realize that quite often we're just, South America and Africa, we're speaking different languages, and I don't mean like actual different languages, but we're just talking using different terms for the same vegetation or using the same term for different vegetations. And so we just need to talk more. And this doesn't mean like we need to be flying between continents more, uh, which ha has its own issues, but let's just communicate more and, and have comparative studies where people use the same methods uh, in different countries, in different vegetation types. So yeah, just more boots on the ground as always. And, um, and yeah, let's talk more across countries and continents.
That's all I have to say. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would like to thank you. It was a great opportunity. I was really afraid to talk with, in the same webinar with these big names. And I missed two nervous, I think. I don't know if I'm able to sleep this night. But I'm really uh, happy to, to learn a lot with the talks, with the questions. And some of them was not uh, time to, to answer. I don't know, Jennifer, we can answer after the... Yeah. yeah, and I think my, my, maybe my take home message is uh, thinking in Cerrado, in savannas around the world, tropical savannas, and it's time to look inside uh, the ground layer, dig deep and understand the process with the system as a whole. We have a really good stuff for the three layer, and I think when we understand more the the other growth forms and how they act to shape the system in the, in the system function, we will be able to conserve and maybe to restore and predict the changes in the future of this amazing system that I'm in love about Savannah. So.